Good morning. It's seven o'clock. Now, after that devastating testimony from Dominic Cummings, today we get the government fight back. The Health Secretary, Matt Hancock, will face MPs this morning to answer claims he lied to colleagues and should have been fired on at least 15 occasions. In a moment, the Housing Secretary, Robert Jenrick, will respond to accusations made by Mr Cummings yesterday. And after eight, we'll hear from Labour's Deputy Leader, Angela Rayner. Also this morning... It's all about your feet and your fingers. Go and get your feet on something good. Scouting for volunteers and new recruits, the movement tackles a dramatic fall in membership because of the pandemic. And he's the scientist who can explain complex astrophysics and the origins of the universe to, well, just about anyone. Neil deGrasse Tyson joins us at 9.45. It's Thursday, the 27th of May. A personal fight back. The health secretary is set to defend his record after the PM's former aide says he should have been sacked for supposedly telling lies about COVID. Fighting the scourge, police say they've significantly reduced the number of county lines gangs smuggling drugs across the UK. Drawn out drama, Man United lose a 22 penalty shootout in the Europa League final. And the weather's getting warmer for the bank holiday weekend, but the weather news isn't all good. Uh, the details coming up shortly. You'll see the six of us in the same room for the first time in at least nine years, if not 17. A lot of laughs, a lot of, um, you know, heartfelt moments, and, and it's been incredible. And they'll be there for you, the one where the cast of Friends reunite. Well, a very good morning to you. The Health Secretary, Matt Hancock, is expected to come out fighting when he faces MPs this morning and holds a Downing Street news conference later. His reputation was savaged by the Prime Minister's former aide, Dominic Cummings, who accused him of lying to colleagues about the pandemic and suggested there were 15 to 20 occasions when he should have been sacked. Boris Johnson is also likely to face questions when he visits a hospital after Mr Cummings branded him unfit for office and said tens of thousands of people didn't need to die. Our chief political correspondent, John Craig, reports. Fighting for his political life after Dominic Cummings said he should be sacked for lying, arriving home last night, a defiant Matt Hancock was ready to fight back. Well, I haven't seen the, uh, this performance today in full, and instead I've been dealing with getting the vaccination rollout going, especially to over 30s and, and saving lives. Uh, I'll be giving a statement in the House of Commons and I'll have more to say then. He's answering an urgent question from Labour in the Commons and later leading a Downing Street news conference on vaccines. When he answers questions from MPs, Mr Hancock will say he absolutely rejects the claims made about him by Mr Cummings. He'll say that both he and the staff in his department have worked incredibly hard during the pandemic to protect the NHS and save lives. At his Downing Street news conference, Mr Hancock will claim fantastic progress is being made on vaccines, with more than half a million people a day now getting a jab. And Boris Johnson is visiting a hospital today to underscore the message of getting on with the job that he delivered in the Commons yesterday. In his bombshell evidence to MPs, Mr Cummings claimed tens of thousands of people died from Covid who didn't need to die and that Mr Johnson was unfit to be Prime Minister. Fundamentally, I regarded him as unfit for the job and I was trying to create a structure around him to try and stop what I thought were extremely bad decisions and push other things through against his wishes. Tens of thousands of people died who didn't need to die. The problem in this crisis was very much lions led by donkeys over and over again. But his most brutal attack was on Mr Hancock. The Secretary of State for Health should have been fired for at least 15, 20 things, including lying to everybody in multiple occasions, in meeting after meeting in the, in the Cabinet room and publicly. Tory MPs claim Mr Cummings is settling scores and are backing Mr Hancock. What Mr Cummings has said is tittle-tattle from yesterday. was really important for Sky viewers and for all the British population 
is us getting fully out of this pandemic. But Labour says Mr Hancock must answer Mr Cummings' allegations. Anyone who has lost a loved one in this awful crisis will expect Matt Hancock to explain, to explain whether Dominic Cummings is correct or whether he's correct. He's being accused of failing to protect care homes. He's being accused of misleading the nation and the most senior people in government. However, I am aware that he does have the right to give his side of the story. After more than seven hours of evidence, Mr Cummings appeared to be pondering the reaction to his allegations as he paced up and down outside Parliament. But Mr Hancock insists he's not running away and his fight back begins later this morning. John Craig, Sky News. Well, as Dominic Cummings gave his evidence, the daily COVID data revealed the highest number of cases since mid-April. There were 3,180 new infections reported and nine more deaths. That means the total number of people who've died within 28 days of a positive test is now 127,748. Another 186,147 people had their first vaccination and 387,987 had their second. So in total, nearly 62 million injections have now been administered across the UK. OK, let's talk to the Housing Secretary, Robert Jenrick, who joins us now. Very good morning to you. Did Mr Hancock lie to the Cabinet and to the public repeatedly? Well, good morning. I'm not going to get into the specific allegations that were made. We've heard one side of the story. There will be a full public inquiry next year, and that's absolutely the right thing to do because people have lost loved ones. This has been an incredibly difficult period for everyone, some people much more profoundly than others. What the government must do is keep on responding to the pandemic. You heard earlier the Prime Minister is getting on with the job. We're all yeah, but, going but look, to keep look, on working to ensure the vaccine for, rollout for, for, continues. For, forgive me for interrupting. Way it has been at the moment. And we forgive begin to me, recover Minister, our forgive public me, Minister, services for interrupting. and our economy. Look, it's, it's, it's no good you appearing on this programme and not being prepared to, to answer questions. And with the greatest of respect, we've heard all about what the government's doing with the rollout. And what we hear that every single day, and a lot of people say it is a, it is a very good thing. But it, what people will take from your response to that first answer, first question is that you're not prepared to back the Health Secretary. Why not? Well, look, I think that the Department for Health and the Health Secretary have worked exceptionally hard over the course of this pandemic. This was an unprecedented situation. It was a national effort involving all parts of government and all parts of the country. I think the public will appreciate that. If you think back to the events of this time last year, how challenging it really was Many things happen. Of course, there'll be things which we could have done better, and we're learning those lessons as we go along. The public inquiry will air that and hear the evidence in a reasoned and reflective manner. I think that is the right way to do that. But I, absolutely, I think the country responded phenomenally to the events of last year. My point was that we are still responding to the pandemic, and that has to be the focus of government right now. Yes, well, you are responding to the pandemic, but if we're going to have any lessons learnt in moving forward, and we'll talk about the inquiry a bit more in a moment, but in terms of mo learning lessons in the immediate term, we need to know, don't we, whether y you think the Health Secretary lied to the Cabinet on multiple occasions, lied to the public on multiple occasions. I mean, it, it, is that absolutely unfounded? Well, look, my, that's not my experience. My experience when I worked with the Health Secretary and with the Prime Minister last year were of people doing everything that they could under huge pressure in a unique situation to try to steer the country through the pandemic and at every turn trying to act in the best interests of the whole country. That's, of course, what we would have expected of them and that's what they did. Were there things that we could have done differently or better? I'm sure that there were. There were also many things that the country got very right. The vaccine rollout, of course, is one of the most prominent of them, but there are other examples as well. In okay, my own department, about, me, we I managed about, to get all of the rough sleepers of the country homes? off the streets within two weeks, for example. Yeah, can, can I ask you about care homes? Because that's a, a really important issue. And we, were, we were told there was going to be a shield around care homes. I mean, that would, uh, you know, appear to... Mr Cummings says the government rhetoric about the shield around care homes was absolute nonsense. 
And we do know, and we, you know, we have hard empirical data that, about the number of deaths of people in care homes. Well, I think the position of people in care homes was extremely difficult. They were, of course, the most elderly and often the most frail members of society. I think there are things we, with the benefit of hindsight, could have done better to protect people in care homes. We didn't, of course, know all of the things we know today about the virus. At the very beginning, for example, we didn't know how uh, asymptomatic people were able to transmit the virus or the extent that they were able to transmit. And that was an important factor when we were weighing up uh, discharging people from hospital and returning them either to care homes or uh, to their own homes. So there were things that we learned along the way, and I hope that we learned them as quickly as we could, taking the scientific advice as it evolved. But we did make steps to protect people in care homes as soon as we could. We did provide uh, over £3 billion of funding to the sector. We did put in place uh, care packages and, and measures so that uh, people working in care homes uh, could care for them. We went to huge lengths to get PPE to them. That was very challenging at times. Uh, and there were moments when people in care homes felt that it was touch and go. But across the whole country, we did manage to get the PPE to the front line. So I don't think anybody is disputing the fact that care homes are one of the most difficult elements of the last 12 months or so. But it's not correct to say that we didn't do everything we possibly could to protect both the residents and the people who work in the care homes with the imperfect information that we had available to us at the time. Well, apart from not testing people who are being sent to care homes, which you'd think would be pretty fundamental. Well, I think that's my point, isn't it? That at the time, the very beginning of the pandemic, the scientific advice wasn't what we know today, which is that this is a virus which can transmit uh, asymptomatically. Uh, there was very little understanding of that. That was an unusual situation. Had we known that at the beginning, I think we probably would have done more uh, to test people as they were leaving hospital before they went into care homes. And that's something that clearly we've learned as we've gone along and uh, we're making sure that that doesn't happen again. But it's very easy to make that judgment with hindsight. That wasn't the case at the time, as you can see, if you read the advice that ministers were receiving, if you read uh, the minutes of SAGE, for example, which are all in the public domain, you'll see that our knowledge of the virus was quite limited to begin with. Mm. It grew very rapidly thanks to a fantastic team of scientific advisers. Oh, look, there's no, there's no doubt hindsight is a wonderful thing. But, but nevertheless, you know, we've still got to look at in detail about what happened. I mean, you, you say the government was following scientific advice. In September, it's claimed the Prime Minister was sort of the only person in the room... Uh, amongst members of the cabinet and amongst the advice given by, given by the, uh, the chief scientific advisor, uh, that there should be a second lockdown. The PM apparently just didn't want one. I mean, what were you thinking when you heard the prime minister say that amid the voices of everybody else? Well, all I can say is that at every time the Prime Minister acted in the best interest of the country as he saw it. And it's the job of the Prime Minister to take a rounded view, weighing up the health advice, the economic advice. Because remember, lockdowns are very damaging, not just economically, but to public services, to wider health and well-being. And that's the difficult job that he does, having to take that rounded view. It, it was also not the case that everyone was calling for a, a lockdown uh, of the kind that we went into later in the autumn Remember, many people were asking for a short two-week circuit breaker. I think it's pretty clear today that that would not have succeeded. That was bad advice. Could we have gone into the kind of longer-term lockdown that we did slightly earlier? Perhaps. But then, of course, we didn't know uh, about the variants that we later learnt about and how seriously transmissible they were. So I think these judgments are harder to make at the time than you might imagine. Of course, with the benefit of hindsight, we're able to look back upon them. And these are things which will be which, weighed up carefully, I'm sure, when we do come to that public inquiry well, next year. Well, exactly. I mean, and, and that does need to be... Obviously, that public inquiry is going to be absolutely crucial, but when we've got concerns over Indian variant, we've got concerns over potential other v variants coming forward, because we know they may well emerge, 
We've got concerns over potentially something happening in the summer with the rising cases. We know there's concern from the scientists over uh, a winter surge as well. Why not have an inquiry now so that we can learn the lessons and be in a much better position for anything that may happen later in the year? Well, we are learning lessons. We're learning lessons as we go along. We've just discussed some of the, the lessons that we've learnt, such as the fact that we didn't know at the beginning uh, quite well, yes, how transmissible why not the virus the was and now. its impact on the asymptomatic. We learnt that as quickly as the evidence became available and we adapted and evolved our strategy. Do I think that holding a full public inquiry right now, whilst we're still responding to the pandemic, whilst we're still grappling with some of the issues you've just set out, like the new variants, like... Uh, the when to reopen our economy, how we recover public services. No, I don't think that would be the sensible thing to do. I think next spring seems like a logical time because hopefully the country will be in a vastly uh, different and improved situation then. Public inquiries are lengthy processes. We've seen that with all of the ones uh, in the recent past. And they're better, I think, to occur when we're out of the immediate response phase and then we can take a reflective view look at the evidence carefully, not just listen to individuals uh, making testimony, as we heard yesterday, but look at the evidence in the round and learn the lessons, obviously, for the future. Minister, good to talk to you. Thank you. Well, we will have full coverage of Matt Hancock's appearance in the House of Commons here on Sky News. That's this morning from half past ten. We'll also bring you coverage of his Downing Street News Conference, which will be at five o'clock this afternoon. And we'll comb through the details of Dominic Cummings' evidence at half past seven this morning with a member of the SAGE Committee and a journalist who's covered the career of Boris Johnson. Labour will give us their response to those allegations. We'll talk to their deputy leader, Angela Rayner, at five past eight. And... Tom Templeton gave up his job as a journalist to retrain as a doctor in his 30s. He'll tell us why he made such a, mi a major life change at half past nine. Now, police say they've significantly reduced the number of so-called county lines gangs smuggling drugs. It follows a week of raids across the country earlier this month. Well, let's get details from Aisha Zahid, who's in the newsroom for us this morning. What do we know, Aisha? Well, these arrests were made last week as part of a national crackdown on county lines gangs across the UK, and they involve various police forces across the country. Now, as you said, more than a 1,000 arrests were made in that week beginning the 17th of May, and just under 300 weapons were seized as well in the crackdown, which included 33 guns and 219 knives as well. Now, Police say there are currently around 600 of these gangs operating in the UK, which is actually down from about 2,000. Now, county lines gangs are essentially uh, drug dealers who sell to customers based in rural areas through dedicated phone lines. And in, these, in this crackdown, 80 of these phone lines were discovered on seized mobile phones. Now, these gangs often use vulnerable adults as well as children as drug mules to transport drugs uh, and often conceal and deal from their own homes. So police also visited 904 addresses of concern and as a, re as a result, 1,138 people are currently being safeguarded. So police have also said that in the past 18 months they've made substantial progress in tackling these gangs and this crime, but uh, it's hoped by focusing resources in this way and these kinds of crackdowns will help tackle the problem uh, going forward. Sure, thank you. Now, also in the headlines this morning, a gunman has shot dead eight workers at a rail yard in California. It happened at the Santa Clara Valley Transportation Authority depot near San Jose. We have eight victims that are pronounced deceased from today's incident, from gunshot wounds. We also have one suspect who is deceased as well from this morning's incident. I can confirm with you that deputies did not exchange gunfire. And right now, we're going to preliminary go with the assumption that it was a self-inflicted gunshot wound from the suspect. And deputies did not exchange gunfire. At this point, we have investigators on scene interviewing anybody that was on scene to see what exactly happened. A week-long lockdown has been ordered for 7 million people in Australia. Everyone in the state of Victoria will have to stay at home from tonight for seven days after a cluster of cases of coronavirus. 
Officials in one Canadian province say they'll decide whether to lift their lockdown depending on local vaccination rates. The Premier of Alberta says restrictions will be eased for every 10% of the population over 50% which receives the jab. Uh, there's been disappointment for Manchester United as they lost to Villarreal in the Europa League final. A 22 shot penalty shootout ended when Villa, the Villarreal goalkeeper scored his penalty before saving one taken by the Manchester United goalkeeper. France has again tightened restrictions on British travellers entering the country. It follows, <coughs> excuse me, concern about the spread of the Indian variant of COVID-19. Let's talk to our Europe correspondent, Adam Parsons, who's in Brussels for us this morning. I mean, just what exactly are the French authorities saying? So we're going to get uh, full details later today, Stephen, but uh, what we are expecting is that France will say that uh, there will be no UK visitors allowed through unless they have a, an essential purpose, such as being uh, a resident, and that those who do come through will have to produce a PCR test uh, that is no more than, and we are ex awaiting this either 36 or 48 hours old, at the moment it's, it's 72 hours, and that people who come in will then have to self-isolate for, uh, again, we wait to potentially seven days or, or even 10 days. Now, at the moment, when you go into France, you are asked to quarantine uh, for a week, but frankly, it is not checked up upon. This time, they're making it quite clear that there will be police checks and there will be hefty fines on those who break the rules. Uh, and it follows, as you said, the, the increasing anxiety here on the European continent about this uh, Indian variant. Uh, Germany has also tightened its controls on UK visitors, insisting uh, on a two-week quarantine. Now, th this uh, announcement from France sort of came out dribs and drabs yesterday. It will be confirmed later on with those precise details. But I think it does reflect that concern. And also this lingering worry about what they call reciprocity here. It's a word you hear quite often when you discuss COVID restrictions. Uh, the French, the Germans and others point to the fact that if they visit the UK, then they are subject to a 10-day quarantine. So they say it's not that surprising that those coming from the UK into the European mainland face their own form of quarantine. But for many, of course, those who've been looking forward to a summer holiday, it will come as a, as a disappointment. France had pointedly loosened its restrictions for visitors not so long ago, had taken away that requirement for an essential purpose. And it also creates a, a division in Europe where you have France or Germany now tightening restrictions while, company, uh, while countries like Spain are opening their arms to welcome UK visitors. Adam, thank you. Now, it's one of the most popular shows in TV history. And today, 17 years after heading off to a new life, Friends is back. Since it's ended, it's become one of the most downloaded shows in Britain and the new reunion programme is now available on Sky. Here's our entertainment reporter, Claire Gregory. Oh, my God. Here we go. It was an incredible time. Everyone was so perfectly cast. It's this the one the Friends one fans have been fun. waiting for. And those of us who've been to reunions know they can be woefully disappointing. But the difference with this group of mates getting back together is they reportedly made around £1.5 million pounds each. <laughs> I remember I went to the producer of the show I was on and he said, that show's not going to make you a star. You'll see guest stars, you'll see surprises. You'll see the six of us in the same room for the first time in at least nine years, if not 17. A lot of laughs, a lot of, um, you know, heartfelt moments and, and it's been incredible. The final episode broke records when it aired 17 years ago and the show quickly became the most streamed in the UK when it arrived on Netflix four years ago. You still can't escape repeats, but through a modern lens, some of the language, jokes and a lack of diversity has been criticised. But the show's impact on modern culture is undeniable. Its legacy includes the term friend zone, catchphrases like how are you doing and its influence on other sitcoms like How I Met Your Mother and New Girl. 
The reunion episode, which features guests such as Lady Gaga and David Beckham, is unscripted. So the actors reminisce rather than reprise their roles. They have lots of surprises, lots of chats, you know, Janice is back for an oh my God and things like that. There are some lovely little moments. And even though it's indulgent, I think it still keeps it fresh. It's still very funny. There are clips of the old episodes. I think people will enjoy it more than they think they will. It might not be the reboot that fans of the series were really hoping for, but the reunion episode will be there for TV audiences hungry for nostalgia and escapism. Claire Gregory, Sky News. Fabulous. I mean, come on, you can't say you're not excited just to see what they're going to say. I am. Now, just before we have a look at the weather with Joe, uh, take a look at this. And Greece has seen some of the best views of a combined lunar eclipse and supermoon. Uh, of course, very red as a result of all of that. More than 2,000 miles uh, from... Oh, 200,000 miles from Earth. Someone's written 2,000 miles from Earth. That would be a bit worrying. Uh, it was seen... <laughs> rising behind the Greek temple of Poseidon. Beautiful. What a colour. And actually, the moon driving down this morning, because you told me to look out for it yesterday, the moon was looking pretty big here as well. Oh, absolutely extraordinary. And the thing is, it swaps place with the sun so quickly as well, if you happen to be around, because obviously we're only three weeks away from the longest day now. So the moon was there, huge in the sky, lighting everything up, and then replaced by the sun. And it was very much a 50 50 situation. Love that moon. Absolutely beautiful. Uh, well, of course, we are very close to the longest day. Uh, it's been one of the wettest Mays on record, but things are are improving for the bank holiday weekend. Let's take a look. Look forward to brighter skies. The weather, sponsored by Qatar Airways. Hello, good morning to you. So what we've got is low pressure to the west, low pressure to the east, and that kind of gives us this little bit of nothingness in the middle. Not as good as high pressure and control, but certainly not bad. We're going to pull up this uh, warmth for a start. Temperatures topping 20 degrees Celsius over much of the bank holiday weekend, but at times cloud and rain threatening from the west or the northwest. And that's very much the situation today. This uh, cloud rolls in across Ireland. It's going to bring some patchy rain with it. Much of the UK mainland starting off really nice today. Some fog to get rid of and some low cloud on the eastern coast but once that's gone sunshine a little bit of fair weather cloud bubbling up as time goes on and the risk of one or two isolated showers over northern england and out towards the east as well the weather sponsored by qatar airways joe thank you still to come on sky news breakfast westminster is still buzzing following the extraordinary appearance of dominic cummings before mps yesterday we'll look into it in a bit more detail in just a couple of minutes. It's, uh, it's an amazing feeling. You never go into writing something and and ever expecting that it could reach as many people as this song has. It's, uh, it's been quite amazing. It was just written as a 45 second TV theme song and there was some radio disc jockey that uh, kept getting requests to play it on their program. So he just looped it three times in a row to try to make it the length of a pop song. And that's when Warner Brothers Records came back to me and said, uh, we better write a full length version of this song and put it on the Rembrandt's album. Uh, I used to go to the filmings of the show. It was kind of a family affair. Uh, my wife at the time was one of the creators of the show, Marta Kaufman. And um, I used to bring my children to the set on Friday nights when we would film the show in front of a live audience. And in the beginning, uh, they would bring the cast out to introduce them to the audience uh, playing the theme song. And one night early on, the whole audience did the four hand claps in the right spot. The song is being played, and I went, oh, my God, we've got lightning in a bottle here somehow. People have been dying for this cast to get back together ever since the show went off the air. So it's really like a, 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 such a sense of healing. It's, it's like seeing your best friends get back together again. Um, and while they will not be portraying those characters, 
just seeing the actors together and feeling the emotions of how much they mean to each other is, uh, I think, is going to be quite moving. The Housing Secretary, Robert Jenrick, has rejected claims that Matt Hancock lied about his handling of the pandemic. Former Downing Street adviser Dominic Cummings alleged the Health Secretary lied on multiple occasions when he appeared before a parliamentary committee yesterday. Now, a short time ago, the Housing Secretary said he didn't recognise those claims. That's not my experience. My experience having worked with the Health Secretary and with the Prime Minister last year were of people doing everything that they could under huge pressure in a unique situation to try to steer the country through the pandemic and at every turn trying to act in the best interests of the whole country. That's of course what we would have expected of them and that's what they did. Were there things that we could have done differently or better? I'm sure that there were. Let's talk to our political correspondent Tamara Cohen who's in Westminster. What do you make of that Tamara? Well, I think you can see the government trying to rally around Matt Hancock to an extent. Um, I mean, he said he wasn't his experience, perhaps they're not the most ringing endorsement. And I think we'll be interested to see what the Prime Minister says about that. Uh, when he um, appears later this morning, he's going uh, to a hospital where no doubt he'll be asked about this. Matt Hancock himself is going to be taking questions in the House of Commons today. His team say he absolutely rejects uh, what Dominic Cummings said about him, which essentially is that he uh, should have been fired 20 times because he lied about PPE, he lied about testing uh, and about, about testing of people going into care homes and that everyone was getting the treatment that they needed. Now, Dominic Cummings did not provide any evidence of this and, and we wait to see uh, what Matt Hancock has to say about it. But you can see government ministers saying everyone was working as hard as they could with the knowledge that they had at the time that we now know a lot more about uh, COVID than we did then. And so obviously in hindsight, things could have been done differently. But I think what will be very difficult to brush off is what Dominic Cummings says was a complete failure of the system. All the key decision makers, all the plans, he says, were getting everything wrong. And that is going to be more difficult for the government to dig its way out of. OK, Tamara, thank you. Well, of course, there were more than seven hours of questions and answers yesterday, and uh, Dominic Cummings painted a very negative picture of the way the government handled the pandemic. Let's talk to Professor Susan Mitchie, who's director of the University College London Centre for Behaviour Change and is also a member of SAGE and Independent SAGE. Good to see you this morning. Look, did, did any of the testimony yesterday um, uh, sort of tick any boxes for you? Did you recognise any of what was being said? Well, obviously, I don't know what goes on at the heart of government, um, but he did paint a very depressing picture. And as a scientist, uh, spending a lot of my last year, along with many, many other colleagues, um, spending hours a week um, on thinking about science, writing about science, providing scientific advice on top of our day jobs, it's quite depressing to think that all that work and all the many reports that we've produced um, weren't landing and possibly weren't being considered. So, but, I mean, but, I mean, from what you've seen and, and from how the things worked out during the pandemic, do you think that is the case? Do you think that your advice was ignored? I think one of the frustrations about um, having given scientific advice over this last year is that um, there isn't feedback as to whether the fact that some of our advice isn't acted on is because 
it was rejected, it wasn't thought to be good, or maybe there are other political priorities. Um, so one never really knows what the explanation is when the advice we give isn't being implemented. And I think that's um, a shame because I think it's quite demoralizing for scientists. But also I think it's important for the public to know how taxpayers' money is being spent because obviously um, there's a substantial expense to um, serving a big scientific infrastructure. So I think it's really helpful for everyone to know um, the extent to which scientific advice is being used. But, but in, in general, in terms of what... I mean, we've been told throughout this, pretty much, that, that, that we're being led by the science. Now, we know that's not always the case, and the, you know, the, the economy has to have a very big say in all of this as well. I mean, there are lots of different factors mm -hmm. to consider. But, but in the course of the pandemic, have there been some glaring incidences which you think, you know, that the government has not acted in the best interest of what SAGE has been telling them? Well, there are several examples of where um, the scientific advice wasn't followed. And um, I've worked with policymakers in government for decades, and I would never expect policymakers um, to follow the science. The hope is they will be informed by the science. Um, an example, I think, where the advice was sidestepped was um, the moving from a two-metre rule to a one-metre-plus rule. And um, SAGE didn't waver from its advice that two metres is significantly safer. But in that instance, um, instead of saying, well, actually, we're not going to follow that advice for these reasons, i.e. be transparent about the process, instead, um, the Prime Minister said he set up a Downing Street review of some scientists and economists. Um, and then on the basis of that, they changed to one metre plus. But we were never told who were the people on that review? What evidence did they look at? How did they come to their conclusions? And so that's an example where uh, when the science didn't suit, um, the government sidestepped it uh, without any transparency. And I think that's unfortunate. I mean, do you think... <clears throat> I mean, there's lots of calls for a public inquiry to be held sooner than spring next year. We understand all the arguments involved in that, but, but when it does happen, do you think we are going to get that transparency? I actually think we need an inquiry as soon as possible. And actually, it takes the best part of a year to set up an inquiry to um, get the chair, the members in place, the terms of reference, the scope agreed, etc. Um, so this should be being done right now, if there's any chance of it even starting next spring. And I haven't heard that any of this preparatory work is being done. And hearing about the lack of preparation and planning um, from Mr Cummings yesterday makes me very concerned about this inquiry. Is it that they're going to start thinking about it next spring, which would mean it wouldn't start till the year after, which means it won't it won't come to any conclusions for many, many years. So I think this is really urgent and it does need to be transparent. I think the lack of transparency is a real problem because, first of all, it means there's not the um, public and scientific scrutiny and accountability, um, but also it means there's less trust by everyone and trust is such an important thing during a pandemic when we want everybody to pull together so that we can get out of this as soon as possible. Susan Mitchie, really good to talk to you. Thank you. Pleasure. OK, let's talk to former parliamentary sketch writer Andrew Jimson, who's written a book about Boris Johnson. Good to see you this morning. Do you think that the, the evidence yesterday will prove to be damaging not only to, to the Prime Minister and the Health Secretary in particular, but to the, the way the government has, has operated throughout this pandemic? I thought the evidence was highly convincing. Cummings plainly wasn't telling the whole truth, but he was telling part of the truth. And we all know that the government was disgracefully un, unprepared for this pandemic. And elementary things like producing enough um, protective personal equipment, um, I mean, where I live, people actually went round to the local hospital and started making it themselves. We really should have uh, uh, been ready to deal with problems, elementary problems like that, and we weren't. And Cummings was quite right about that. Yeah, yeah, well, I mean, what, why do you think you, you believed a, a lot of what he said? I mean, he is, in some respects, a, a man out for revenge, isn't he? A, a he man is. who's been scorned. He is, and I think that's one reason why it, 
it probably won't damage the government that much because if there's one person who people in the wider um, country have heard of, it's Dominic Cummings, and many people are still extremely angry about um, his his expedition to Durham and to Barnard Castle. So I think actually, and, and also it's a bit like, it is, oddly enough, I think the psychology is a bit like the Second World War. In the Second World War, we had all sorts of appalling disasters for several years, um, not only under Neville Chamberlain, but under Winston Churchill, and then we won the war, and everyone felt so glad that we won the war, of course, so sad at the terrible casualties which had occurred. But the, the, the joy of winning um, somehow eclipsed the anger at the extreme waste of life and, and so on, which had occurred uh, as we worked our way, as we learned how to win that victory. And I think it's something of the same feeling. People feel so good about the vaccinations that they are, to some extent, prepared to forgive um, the, the terrible mistakes which were made earlier. Also, Cummings is always prepare, prepare, making this comparison between what happened and some sort of rather illusory idea of a perfect response, which admittedly he says, you know, they, were, they did it very, very well in Taiwan and we weren't prepared to learn from Taiwan and South Korea um, and, and Singapore. Um, but the, the wider public know that life is, is never perfect, that government makes terrible mistakes. And as long as it learns from them and the learning in this case may have been rather slow, but as long as it does, and the whole thing turns out all right in the end, mm. the terrible loss of life, then, and I mean, the, the polls suggest that at the moment people are not trying to turn sort of Boris Johnson into the Neville Chamberlain of the pandemic. Yeah, I mean, is Dominic Cummings playing a political game here? I mean, whether he's making some valid points or not, the fact is, you know, going for the Prime Minister, going for Matt Hancock, but you know, being quite nice about Dominic Raab and, and not criticising particularly uh, Rishi Sunak. I mean, is he playing politics here? There is an element of politics, and he does tend to divide the word in, world into heroes and villains. So that's undeniable. I think, oddly enough, I think it's rather to Boris Johnson's credit that these arguments were going on in Number 10, even if the wrong side sometimes won. Uh, he, I think he... Johnson does like to be surrounded by very able people, and Cummings is palpably very, very able, and was getting to grips with the science, um, although he's quite modest about his own scientific attainment, and was bringing in very, very clever people to challenge the groupthink, and, the, and the, there is always a danger of groupthink in these things. And I think Cummings is completely right that the scientific evidence um, should generally be presented so that it can be reviewed by other scientists, uh, and we can all see what the arguments are that they're making. But the, the, I, re, I return to the point that the public know that this was an incredibly difficult thing to deal with. Um, the people dealing with it were under enormous pressure, uh, yeah. and the public is not going to be quite as quite as um, censorious as Cummings is. Yeah, I mean, look, uh, we know that in, in terms of playing politics, uh, people tend to like a sacrificial lamb. It doesn't look like the Prime Minister is going to be too badly damaged by this in some respects, as you said. But what about Matt Hancock? Well, Hancock acts, for, from Johnson's point of view, as a, as a valuable diversion, I think. And Johnson won't throw Hancock off the sledge. Johnson, in fact, has been very reluctant to throw anyone off the sledge for any reason, however strong, because he knows that the feral beasts... Uh, in the media, as soon as we've got um, one, um, one, one bloody corpse, um, and we want another one. So um, it doesn't do any good. Um, but that, I mean, that, that's, that's rather comforting, I think, for, for Johnson, that Hancock on this occasion has, has had to soak up a lot of the pressure. Andrew, good to talk to you. Thank you. Thank you. I just want to bring you some breaking news relating to the vaccine rollout. And health officials in Northern Ireland have just announced the programme is now open to everyone. They say the booking system will now accept details for anyone aged over 18. Now, one of Britain's leading military charities is warning veterans will find it increasingly difficult to work after they leave the forces. The Forces in Mind Trust says many employers misunderstand what types of skills that ex-service personnel have. Ashna Hurunag reports. Eleven years ago, Fiona left the Royal Air Force and stepped into civilian life. But for five years, she struggled to find work despite an adaptable skill set. 
you are perhaps worse off than someone who's had four years of work experience post-university in the civilian world. You're having to relearn all this stuff that I really must admit I, I didn't think I'd need because I thought I was sorted for life, frankly, and that whatever came along post-forces would be able to benefit from that kudos and that experience. When you leave early, the rug is pulled out from underneath you. The changing face of conflict means the work of the armed forces is increasingly technology-based. Our adversaries have become skilled at undermining us by exploiting the grey zone while maintaining the threat of conventional hard power. With disinformation, intimidation and cyber hacks, weapons of choice. The role of those on this invisible front line means skills are easily misunderstood and overlooked. A leading charity is warning there will be more veterans like Fiona in the coming decades who may be left behind. Throughout their service careers, they need to be uh, getting the civilian qualifications. They need to be exposed to civilian workplaces through, through job placement exercises. There needs to be a much closer link between armed forces personnel and their families and civilian society, the communities they're going to retire into. So these are all actions which need to be improved upon. The psychological effects of working in this murky evolution of warfare is also unknown. The infrastructure of support, they argue, needs to be rethought. What our challenge is, is actually get, getting businesses and organisations to recognise um, what our armed forces actually have to offer. Because, you know, the size of our armed forces is very, very smaller uh, than they have been in, the, in a number of decades. Therefore, people's absolute appreciation of what our veterans offer perhaps isn't so uh, obvious. Only few understand the trials of the transition, and many of them say more support is needed to help this league of men and women find their identity in civilian society. Ash Naharinag, Sky News. Of course, as we've been saying, a lot of the focus on the Dominic Cummings evidence yesterday was based around Matt Hancock, a man who should have been fired 15 to 20 times, says Mr Cummings. Well, Matt Hancock's not got a lot to say this morning. Mr Hancock, Mr. 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 Hancock, Mr. Hancock, how do you feel about these called a liar? Does the country still I'm have confidence just, in you, I'm, I'm just off to drive forward the vaccine programme and then I'll be going to the House of Commons and I'll answer questions there. Thanks very much. Did you know symptoms of hay fever can develop at any stage of life, not just in childhood? The Pollen Reports, sponsored by Philips Connected Air Purifiers. Not a bad day in store today. Plenty of dry weather for the UK mainland, although it will be a little bit misty and murky over eastern coast to start off with. Later in the day, we see some patchy rain working its way in across Ireland and it'll be making its way eastwards, but slow progress. Temperatures between 17 and 21 degrees Celsius, so warmer than it has been. And technically, we're in the grass pollen season now, although there is still some tree pollen around. Levels are likely to be moderate through the south, but low across the rest of the country. The Pollen Reports, sponsored by Philips Connected Air Purifiers. Now, after a week of raids across the country, police say they've significantly reduced the number of so-called county lines gangs smuggling drugs. Let's talk to National Police Chief Counsel and Deputy Assistant Commissioner of the Metropolitan Police, Graham McNulty. Good to see you this morning. Look, explain to us, for those of us who don't know, um, quite what county lines are and how they operate. Good morning. Well, county lines is an abhorrent crime type where drug dealers in the cities are exploiting young people and vulnerable adults to send drugs across the country and they're making a profit from it. We see significant levels of violence and we also see exploitation. Um, so this week was really focused on targeting the people behind the line, the line holders, the individuals taking the profit out of drug dealing. And we're really pleased we've had over 1,100 arrests We've closed down 80 lines um, and officers across the country from every force have worked incredibly hard to keep our communities safe. So I'm really pleased. I mean, it's, it's clearly been a very big operation. I mean, how, how long in the planning is something like this? So something like this takes a long time and it's quite quick for me to give you those headline figures, isn't it? But I'm very conscious um, police officers and staff have put a lot of preparation in 
And even now, after we've made those arrests, they'll be working hard to put cases together for the Crown Prosecution Service and to go to court. So many months in the making, but it, it's a real priority for us. And despite the pandemic and the issues that policing has had to face, County Lines has remained a focus for us all during this time. Yeah, I mean, what, what impact has the pandemic had? I mean, obviously, you've, you know, the, the police force have had other priorities. So, so we have, but I, I think policing has been agile and, and we've responded to the way County Lines has changed. So um, coaches haven't been running. Um, obviously, trains have been a lot quieter, the footfall. We've seen some movement into cars for dealing lines and taking drugs across the country. Um, and, and we've responded to that and we've looked at the changing tactics. Uh, and I think the results from this week show that we've been successful in reducing the amount of County Lines. Yeah, but what, what for moving forward, though? Because, I mean, as successful as this appears to have been, it, it, it's an ongoing battle, isn't it? Well, well, Stephen, it is an ongoing battle, and we, we changed our operating model uh, about 18 months ago, and that is showing real success. And we've seen the number of county lines which we thought were active to, from about 2,000 coming down to around 600 now. So that's a big um, reduction. And we're focusing more on modern slavery offences. So these individuals, they're not just drug dealers, they're child traffickers. Uh, and we're now not only arresting from their drug dealing, but we're also arresting them for those slavery offences and putting them before the courts. And of course, there are longer sentences there and there are orders we can use that control them long, you know, long after their sentence has, has finished. So I'm hopeful that we can change this distribution model um, and we really can dismantle county lines. I mean, how, how important is... is public intervention in all of this, you know, people effectively operating as informants, giving you tip-offs, let you know it, letting you know what is going on. So, of course, we, we police by consent and we rely on the public for all sorts of crime types. And, th and this is no different. And, you know, I would appeal to your viewers now um, to look out for the signs of a young person possibly being exploited. You know, are they out during school hours on a train or travelling? Um, are, are we seeing young people with train tickets to venues they shouldn't be going to? Suddenly getting an expensive phone or an expensive pair of trainers. H how did they get that? Is, is someone giving them these gifts in turn for them doing, you know, drug dealing on their behalf? And we want to protect our young generation. And I would, I would really implore everyone out there, if you see a young person and you're worried about them, you can contact the police, you can contact Crime Stoppers, and we want to stop this exploitation. I mean, in terms of... I mean, you, you mentioned the exploitation, obviously the drugs, there's the, the, the modern slavery issue as well, but, I mean, people are going to be concerned, aren't they? Because these, these people are, are, are presumably quite dangerous. I mean, they're dealing with things that involve an, an awful lot of money, and we know that carries a lot of, a lot of danger as well. You're right, we do see a cycle of drugs, weapons and violence, and that's why it's such a priority for us. Um, in particular, we see very serious crimes linked to county lines and serious youth violence, which is why we want people to talk to us, give us information, and why we want to protect young people from getting involved in the first place. If we can prevent them from ever going near a county line, then we've really done our job, and, and we will really focus on, on tackling those line holders, the people behind the line, who leave a trail of misery behind them, but are happy to take the profit out of it. Do, do you think you get enough support in dealing with this? I mean, on, on the basis, the very nature of how they operate is, is you know, to, to do it covertly. So it's not something which makes the headlines very often. Um, do you get enough support in trying to tackle with this, these sort of underlying concerns? So one of the things that I have benefited from since I've been involved in this for the past two years is significant investment. And that has enabled us to set up three task forces, one in Liverpool, one in the West Midlands and one in London. And those three areas are responsible for 80 percent of our county lines. But that focus and those dedicated resources has really helped us to make this difference and get the results that we're talking about today. So um, that investment has helped and, and it's also enabled us to work more closely together. So it's a cross-border crime. It goes across the whole of the country. But what I'm seeing firsthand now is the big exporting forces working really closely with the importing forces. And the way to beat county lines is to tackle both ends of the line at the same time, simultaneously. And that's what we're seeing. And then joint enforcement, joint case preparation, um, and that's how we'll defeat this drugs distribution model. Deputy Assistant Commissioner, good to talk to you. Thank you. Thank you.
OK, this is Sky News Breakfast. Let's have a look at the weather for you with Joe. Look forward to brighter skies. The weather, sponsored by Qatar Airways. Hello there, good morning to you. Well, the sunshine is streaming through the window here in London and for many other parts too. It is going to be a lovely day. It's a little bit grey along eastern coast this morning. Low cloud has rolled in from the North Sea and Ireland not faring so well either. There's a frontal system making its way in. It will be fairly light and patchy, but uh, still rather a grey day to come. So this is the way things look first off. We've got a little bit of mist and fog around over western areas. The sunshine should soon put pay to that. And also that low cloud in the east, that should burn back. Otherwise, we're looking at sunshine, fairly light winds and temperatures higher than they have been recently. Uh, certainly in an area from Manchester down towards the southeast, we could see 20 to 22 degrees Celsius. That's 72 degrees Fahrenheit. Fair weather cloud building up, a few showers breaking out over northern England. That Those uh, melt away later along with the cloud. But throughout the day, Ireland really not having such a good day of it, rather overcast with those outbreaks of rain. The weather, sponsored by Qatar Airways.